Greetings and merry meet to everyone. This is the Great North Pagan Podcast with your host, Thomas Lion Lord, soon to be Lionheart Putton. It is Sunday, March 1st, 2015, and we are here with the third and final installment of the Spiral Tree tradition, but it's certainly not less important as we are now interviewing the one who started the Order of the Aurora, Bolana Morgan. So, Bolana, greetings and welcome to you. Thank you. Well, as always, if you could tell the audience about yourself. Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I guess this, the things that are relevant is that uh, I've been studying paganism um, since I was 12 or 13. I kind of stumbled upon um, Raymond Buckland's Big Blue Book and uh, was just fascinated by it. And eventually, uh, when I was 18 and moved out of the house, I found Grandmother Willow and I have been practicing some form of witchcraft or witch- witchery for the past, um, well, since then. And um, I was uh, initiated into third degree uh, when I when I was um, I'm not sure how old I was. It was the the Samhain of 2005, and shortly after that, we moved to North Dakota, and um, that's where I. Uh, met all all the people that you're familiar with and mm-hmm. and things started shaking up down there and also like long walks in the park and romantic dinners oh don't we all oh. <laughs> <laughs> well then tell me you know when you started the order the roar how that how that all happened I was I had a, a brand new baby and the last three months of my trimester uh, I kept on telling the group I was working with um, then, I said, I feel like something really big is on the horizon. Something really big is about to happen. And they were like, well, of course, you're about to have this baby. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. But I kept on getting this feeling and these signs um, and dreams and other things that something really big was on the horizon. And um, then I was initiated in 2005, um, the same year that my son was born. And part of that, part of being a third degree initiate is a responsibility to pass on the tradition. Uh, it, it's a vocation. Once you take on that, that degree, it is, uh, it is your job and your responsibility to make sure that the tradition survives. And um, being up in North Dakota, uh, several factors kind of played into me looking for people to work with. Uh, one, there were no other witches up there that were, that I could find that I fit in with um, in, a, in a group setting personality wise um, that were working as a functional coven. So that was a big one. Um, and then two, I had just, you know, kind of been initiated in a third degree and I really wanted to kind of flex those uh, teacher muscles and, and see how it could, you know, see how I could do in that role. Of course. And, and, you know, so, and plus I had a brand new baby and I wasn't working and I had a lot of time on my hands. So, um, so I did some magic and um, put out kind of the call, the, the symbol and uh, put some information out on Witchbox and out on Yahoo groups and in a matter of two weeks, I had seven or eight people contact me. I mean, it was crazy. It was, you know, it, the way things lined up was pretty wild. Oh, the glory of Witch Fox. And I think I remember seeing that the Order of the Horse back then, you know, like, I think it was like 2006, 2007-ish, or all that. Yeah. And as we learned in the last part, Bowman was one of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, once you got well, once you got your group all together, then what what did you see as like some of the major goals to get the order started out? Uh, my my major goals was were to mainly get a group of witches competent enough to where I was not the primary facilitator and to where I could pass off and delegate responsibilities. I, I wanted to develop a group of independent fully functional witches that were not dependent on me. So primarily I I wanted a teaching coven. I, I wanted to, you know, grow them up and and uh, pass on pass on the lore. That's and that's a good thing that I've noticed too is the fact of 
getting, you know, spreading spreading the wealth of knowledge, or that you don't have to do all the heavy lifting. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, right. One, well, once you did get the goal started, then got who, you know, doing what? What was one of the major major events that you helped branch out into the community? You know, I think the community involvement. Um, it was almost more of an afterthought. My my initial goals were were to have a a small group, and um, I was I was taking courses at Cherry Hill Seminary, and Cherry Hill Seminary. Uh, I don't know if if you're familiar with it, but it's uh, one of the first pagan seminaries that is working towards accreditation and they offer master of divinity degrees and I was taking courses there and there was a large section of a large group of students that work towards social justice and community building and they kind of turned me on to the idea of doing open sabbats and open groups okay yeah um I'm Open Sabbaths, I, I had done a, a couple um, when I was still, a, 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 I guess an applicant wouldn't be it, but um, before I was initiated, I was involved in a couple different Open Sabbaths as part of another study group. And, you know, they're great, but it was never, it, it was never my primary goal. So it was almost kind of an afterthought. It just kind of happened along the way. I see, I see. I guess that was an interesting terminology. I guess I never had heard of myself too. That would lead to being where you do something all open and being like more of like a, a solitary coven in a sense. I think for for which a group a coven is really essential to to your spiritual growth, and a small group, a small intimate group, has always been the ideal way for which is to to grow spiritually and to work actively. And open sabbats are not always conducive to that type of growth, especially especially the way that I was brought up in in Wicca, where the sabbats are often very theatrical, where you're reading off of a page, and and I really did not like that. I, I wanted to kind of move away from that, um, but did not have a lot of role model, uh, a lot of role models for that, um, for really good, effective, large scale ritual. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, I, I wanted to do open Sabbaths as a, as a celebratory, um, event, but not necessarily as it wasn't, I, I didn't think of it as vital to the growth of the coven. So what were some of the things that you decided to do when you guys first started out then? Mainly, uh, mainly it was, it was all, uh, in-house, I guess you could say, um, you know, we wanted to do S-Bats and we wanted to do the Sabbaths uh, as a group together. And that's when I started developing uh, a 101 curriculum on my own. Um, my teacher, Grandmother Willow, she didn't, she was, she had tons of information and she had, uh, but she was not the most organized of, of persons. And I was trying, I was attempting to organize it more because I do better I study better with organization and but you know but honestly I'm not the most organized person in the whole world so you know I I was trying to so that's when I kind of started the um, started a 101 curriculum um, just taking taking all of us through the elements and and magic and just the basic um, the basic core concepts of Wicca and we started out that way and then from there, I was like, oh, crap, now what are we going to do? <laughs> and um, Kind of like, kinda like, a, it's kinda like a, I'm making this up as I'm going along sort of thing. It really was. It really was. Because I didn't have a lot of resources. You know, w- once you got to third degree, especially, especially 10 years ago, it's kind of like, okay, good luck. Here you go. You know, just here, farewell. Farewell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you're just kind of going out alone, and you, um, I just didn't know of many resources to to um, improve, you know, group dynamics, um, public relations, uh, counseling. You know, all of these things we try to teach in a kind of apprentice model in the traditional coven, but it, it's often not adequate. 
So, yeah, I was making it up. I was totally making it up as I went along. <laughs> because, uh, because then eventually we, we learned that you eventually passed the torch on to Phoenix. Right, yes. Now she now did she now was she kind of like teaching was she learning under you then? Yeah, um, Phoenix, if I remember correctly, she had been reading different books. She had she had been introduced to Wicca, um, I think from you know Scott Hunt Cunningham, and she, I think there was a Yahoo group that we were all a part of that did some meet and greets. You know, we all went out to dinner. And I remember the first time I met with Phoenix was at one of the parks in Grand Forks. And um, she came in with her long flowing skirt. And, uh, you know, you know how she is, her beautiful, bright smile. And um, she, it, it was a lot of fun. So we connected um, pretty quickly at first. And let's see now. But she didn't come in right away. There were... I remember there were some events. We were we were friends through that Yahoo group, and then the coven was kind of separate. But she was having some pretty profound uh, signs and pro- prophe- prophetic dreams. Uh, one of her dreams was about oh, I'm I'm just trying to remember because and I don't have the best memory. But one of her dreams was about the the lights, the Northern Lights, the Aurora, and. Um, she had a couple of other signs like that that really that it was pretty hard to ignore and it was kind of like the universe was knocking on my head hey this chick needs to be a part of the group and um so you know we brought her uh we brought her in and uh she took to it like a fish to water and um very interested in the lore and very interested in uh, the history and I just I just kind of knew that Phoenix was eventually going to reach third degree some people you know you meet them and you immediately know mm-hmm. and um, she was one of those one of those people's it, it's, it's something when she you know she had mentioned the same thing about Sarah Shun as well when she first met her Mm-hmm. And felt that she had a lot of potential as well to learn up and get to the third degree as well. Mm-hmm. And then, and then eventually, as time has went, and they showed me the, like the, all the pictures about how much the order had evolved, how much you know people had come and went and all that, and they they went and took charge. And then eventually, when they had the sister coven create, created the heart of the pentacle. Yeah. How, how did you feel when that that news first reached your, your doorstep? It was amazing. It it was really truly amazing. I, for one, I remember one phone call I had with Phoenix um, before before Heart of the Pinnacle Fellowship started, where Phoenix was like, "Do you realize that I have been high priestess of this coven now for longer?" Than, than you were here, and that kind of blew me away. You know that the that the coven survived that long, and then for it to not only survive that long, but to thrive so much that that it hived off. That it's almost unheard of these days. I mean, to be honest, uh, so many covens that um, well, so many groups that I meet are don't even form into a coven or are very loosely formed into a coven and they don't even last their first year. So for a group to last long enough and be stable enough to hive off, uh, in these day in this day and age is, is mind blowing to me. From Uh, what, from what they've told me, it's almost like if, when, if, if it goes beyond like two years, it almost already feels like an eternity. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah, you're. It's 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 just. Uh, I don't. Know, I'm stumbling on my words because I can't really articulate how um, how exciting it was and kind of mind blowing that that this happened. <laughs> <laughs> and I really, you know, I have to I have to give props to Phoenix for 
for holding the group together that long because because what I said because like I said how groups are so fractious and they and especially the nature of witches we are very independent independently minded people we do not like to be told what to do we do not like to follow the rules that's why we're witches you know <laughs> and for a group of witches for you know an entity like that to to survive to survive is difficult and uh that she's been able to keep it stable for so long is um extraordinary it's like one of my, one of my friends would put it best is that trying to trying to organize witches is sort of trying to herd cats yeah it is well unless you unless you're like my unless you're like my cat marty which you know he can li- he can listen now and then when he feels like it but <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i think that's true of most witches we'll, we'll listen to you if we're in the right kind of mood <laughs> yeah <laughs> so then you're now you're now you got a group there going on where you're at right now right is that right yes um so i've been in wichita for almost five years but i did not immediately start practicing again uh for at least three of those years and but the thing about taking on a third degree oath is that you can try to avoid it and you can try to get away from it, but the universe has its ways of <laughs> <laughs> of drawing you back into uh, your vocation. So, I there I had been getting um, I had been feeling the pull to practice again uh, with a group and not to be so solitary because I because I know that witches work better together. Mm-hmm. Um, a witch alone is is uh it's very difficult to thrive in that situation and but very similar to my situation in fargo there i it's it's just been hard to find a group that we have the same goals and we have you know personalities that work together uh it's it's just been difficult to find that here so i gotta make one of my own (laughs) (laughs) so I'm not, I can't just complain about I can't just complain about it. I mean, if I don't like it, then I need to fix it. So that's kind of what I did. I, I I handpicked some people that I had met at different open sabbats that I thought would work well together and that I thought have think have a lot of potential, and uh, we started just loosely doing uh, sbats, the full moon, the dark moon, and uh, you know I. I feel really close to them and they feel close to me and to each other. And I thought this, everything just kind of lined up the way it did in Fargo and, or in Grand Forks. So I just thought, okay, now's the time. And so I'm trying to, uh, take some of the lessons that I learned, uh, from high priestessing, uh, the order of the Aurora and applying those to the circle of the stag. And so that's, here we are. We've been, We've been circling together for about a year now, but we've only officially been... We only did our coven, covening ritual in July last year. Okay, so you're just taking off the ground. And from the couple of times that I've, I've seen you guys on, on Skype, you seem to like a very, you know, very happy bunch together and all that. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's... Uh, we're, I'm pretty excited. We're really working, really working well together. So, getting to here now... I think you, should, you probably have some really good advice. We've already heard some thus far, but what do you think has been the formula, you know, other than, you know, given, like, equal you know, responsibility for everyone, what do you think has been a formula that's helped, you know, the Covens do so well? It's a, t- it's a tough one. I There are several things that I think uh, I did well and that Phoenix and Sarah Shun do well. And for one thing is you cannot have one person in power that does it all by themselves um for one thing even if you have a really excellent coven head that really knows his stuff or her stuff you they need help Mm -hmm. they need assistance and they need backup and so you cannot do it alone you really need to raise your peers up to um, to your own level so that you can delegate responsibility and that you're not solely responsible for the entire group. It just doesn't work that way. So that that's a big deal is, is um, the coven head cannot do it alone. They have to have help. 
they need to have continued education. They cannot put their own spiritual development and growth uh, to the background at, at the expense of, you know, teaching uh, his or her students. That is a big one. That's a big one because, you know, or at least there are points where you want to say, well, I want to refer you to something. You want to have at least keep, I guess, up to date would be the proper term. Yeah, I, th- I think ha- having those, um, being able to refer out is very important. Uh, it's very crucial that coven heads and high priests and high priestesses acknowledge that they don't know something because, yeah. because for one, it, it takes that uh, pedestal, puts, takes them off their pedestal, and that's not a good place to be, mm-hmm. and it keeps them humble. And two, uh, it, it provides that opportunity uh, for their growth as well. You know, hey, I really don't know much about this area, um, but I know who somebody somebody who does, and maybe we can learn about that together. Um, yeah, that's that's very important. Yeah. <laughs> Was there any? Is there anything else that you can think of that would also be important? Um. Yes. Uh, group dynamics. Having a good understanding of group dynamics is important, and if you. One of the things I was lucky in that when when uh, Order of the Aurora was just in its infancy stages, I was actually taking a group dynamics class at Cherry Hill Seminary, and so some of the things in the bylaws uh, are are a result of that class. I, mm-hmm. It's also very important that you have a process to an, analyze your decision making, and what I mean by that is. First, you have to decide how you're going to make your decisions. Are we going to vote by two-thirds majority? Are we going to have a consensus vote? How? What is our process for making these decisions? That's number one. Mm-hmm. But number two is you need to be able to look at how those how the process works. So once after you've made your decisions, take a step back and say, well, what were the underlying power dynamics here? Is uh, person one agreeing only because the coven head, it was the coven head's idea? Does person one have the, um, do they have the ability to speak up and, and, uh, and offer a different solution? Um, so, and, and so you need to have that process to evaluate your own structure and to ha- for everybody to provide feedback to that. And I think that's kind of what uh, Ua and Hop does or the Spiral Tree does with their, with their retreats is, mm-hmm. is, you know, they get together and they always review the bylaws and they give everybody a chance to, to put their input. And um, so I think that's very important is, is understanding group dynamics and interpersonal dynamics. Um, and, if, and, if, and if at all you can get any extra education on those, those situations, take them. <laughs> take them. <laughs> And that sounds like that's good advice in case any if you came across anyone who was forming their own group and they were having some issues of with some of the other members as well. I take it. Yeah, uh, like I said, a, high, a coven head cannot do it alone. They need to have they need to have someone else to talk to. So you need to have peers outside of your own coven. And and traditionally, when you hive off, your uh, witch queen and I'm doing the little air quotes there your Mm -hmm. queen should be your your counsel so you should be able to go to your initiator and discuss the problems the things that you're having uh having to deal with in coven and but if that is not the case let's say you're starting you're starting a coven without having an initiator you need to have peers outside where you can bounce ideas off Mm -hmm. um, that have an objective point of view so here's kind of a nice, interesting question I asked this about to Bowman as well, since he had been there since the beginning. You know, looking back after all this, did you have any idea this would have gotten the way as far as it's gotten, how big it's gotten? Hell no, that's <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cr- it. Still blows my mind. I can't. I mean, it's just phenomenal. I had no idea it was going to be like this. Um, I I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled at the way things have turned out, and that is that is one of the biggest reasons that I want to join the Circle of the Stag into the Spiral Tree tradition, because, you know, look at... I already feel like the Spiral Tree are... They're my extended family. They're my family, and 
uh, I don't know, it's kind of like coming home again. Um, I don't know, I just don't, I, it's, I don't even know, I'm stumbling on my words again. I'm, I'm thrilled and excited, and I had no idea that it was going to turn out like this. Because spe- especially when, especially when we, when, um, when I was up with, with the OA and we Skype with you, and looking the look at it, especially on Phoenix's face, you get in touch with you. It was like, it was almost like a high school reunion in a sense. <laughs> I know it is kind of funny like that. Yeah, it, it is. It does feel that way. Uh, I might scream like a little girl. I think I did scream like a little girl when I saw her at um, at PSG the last year. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. And you know, like, and as I mentioned, you know, when I for I first got to meet the old way was at Selwyn in 2010, mm-hmm. and that was pretty much I think that was like like the second time that Phoenix did did it open Sabbath and all that, and okay. and I was just, and looking back even then, I've seen how well it's all evolved, how it's all changed, you know, for better and better. Even then, it was it was so wonderful to meet each other, meet everyone. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I have to give uh, Phoenix and Sarachun props for the evolution and for the maintenance of that, um, that, that sustainability. They have, I think I'm, maybe I set some of the foundation of, of sustainability, but they, but they were able to make it happen. They were able to manifest that dream and in ways that I, that I simply could not have done. Um, it, it's really truly a remarkable that they've been able what they've done with the group. So you know, other than you know having your your current group come back with the Spiral Tree tradition, what do you think is looks towards the future? That is, it's a tough one. I I'm so, right now. I'm so focused on the here and now. I'm not sure what the tradition what the future holds. I I hope my hopes are that Circle of the Stag joins with the spiral tree tradition and I hope that eventually we start doing open sabbats and perhaps you know grow as a coven and and but I you know I um if we were to hive off I think it would be really cool if we grew so much that we hived off and then eventually we have little coven groups you know all down the center of the of the (laughs) northern (laughs) continent but i don't know i I really honestly don't know and and i kind of want to just leave that up to the universe because because like your question said i had no idea that that the spiral tree or that ua would be standing almost 10 years later i didn't know that (laughs) and i wouldn't have even asked for that so i think that if i just leave my intentions out in the universe then the universe and the goddess and the god are going to give me back things that are so wonderful that there's things that I would not have even dreamed of to begin with. Oh. Uh, that's kind of, that's what's happened and that's what I expect to happen in the future. <laughs> 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 no pressure, universe. No pressure. We're just, <laughs> just, just, just work with us gods. That's all we ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just expect miracles. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, this is, this has been quite the ride, you know. First Sarah Shun and Phoenix, and then Bowman, and now with you, it's like going back to the back to the beginning. And and I I want to thank you so much, Bolana. This this feels like quite the honor. I I mean I don't think I've ever really got a chance to really sit down and talk with you. I've always wanted to. This is good. This is fun. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for this opportunity. Because. It's it's just it's feel it feels so wonderful and you know yeah here's hoping that we have you know many more and all that and hopefully that you guys can also come up here and we can all get together like you know one big happy family Kel yes, yes. here here, here, here. <laughs> well I hope you all out there in the realm of the internet also enjoyed this wonderful three parter and and we there's been plenty more with the podcast and all that and. And just to, to let you know, in, in a couple weeks, I will be I will be down in Paganicon in the Twin Cities, which will be so, so wonderful, and and we'll also be discussing about how that will go as well. So, but we will sign off for now. And so this is, and so Bolana, thank you again. Thank you. And this is Thomas Lion Lord, soon to be Lionheart Putin speaking. And merry meet, merry part, and merry meet again. 
May the sun